lovely viewers and welcome back to Science Wrap. This week we're doing part two of the Q&A, which is all about biology and the natural world. If you missed last week's episode, I will link it right here. That was all about the physical world and space and a couple of questions on the scientific method. So definitely check that out if you haven't already. Okay, let's go. Goosebumps happen when tiny muscles at the base of the hairs, called erector pillar muscles, contract and cause the hairs to stand on end. This response is triggered by the sympathetic nervous system, which is the brain and nerves in the body that control unconscious things like heart rate, digestion, or being prepared to fight or run away in a dangerous situation. Goosebumps are kind of an evolutionary leftover. In our hominin ancestors, those are our ancestors that were more hairy and looked more like apes. It helped them to keep warm when the environment was cold. By making the hair stand on end, you're essentially making your layer of insulation bigger. It's like having a fluffed up duvet rather than a thin one. Having a fluffed up duvet means there's more air pockets, which can be heated by your internal body temperature and create a nice warm layer close to the skin. Interestingly, you might also notice that you get goosebumps when you're scared or you're in pain. This all has to do with the sympathetic nervous system. Remember how I said it helps prepare you to fight or run away in a dangerous situation? Getting goosebumps and making their hair stand on end is useful in that sense for animals because it makes them look a lot bigger and scarier than they actually are. This could potentially scare off a predator or whatever else is making them fearful. Now, although we're still covered in hair, these hairs are a lot thinner, and so they don't really have the same effect. The discovery of bacteria is very closely linked to the creation of the microscope. Antony von Leeuwenhoek in 1676 was the first to use a microscope to inspect pond water, where he saw what he called animalcules, or tiny animals. Some of these tiny animals were later classified as bacteria in 1828. Another famous scientist you might have heard of is Louis Pasteur. In 1859, he showed that bacteria were the ones responsible for fermentation. The process of protecting products like milk or wine from fermentation is called pasteurization, and it's named after him. An important point about the discovery of bacteria and other microorganisms is it dispelled the common myth at the time which was that miasma, or dirty air, was responsible for causing illnesses. That was later replaced by so-called germ theory, which says that organisms within the environment, such as bacteria, cause illness. But this theory didn't really get popular until the work of Louis Pasteur and others. winter isn't the best time to be wandering around trying to find food or trying to find friends. Animals can waste a lot of energy like this and potentially even die. So another strategy might be to hibernate. We think of hibernation as animals going into a cave or underground and sleeping for a long time. But this isn't technically true. Hibernation is a physiological process where animals go into a state of torpor. Torpor means that there's a significant lowering of body temperature, as well as a slowing down of breathing, heart, and metabolic or energy spending rates. Torpor can happen for a short period of time, like overnight, or when it happens for a longer period of time, it's called hibernation. Okay, but the catch is, only animals that generate body heat from the inside, or who are endothermic, can go into hibernation. And this all relies on having the chemical, physical, and biological ability to do so. Right, so we just talked about hibernation and how it's only for endothermic animals. But what about animals that are ectothermic, or they get their heat from the environment? What are they supposed to do during winter? They could migrate to a different environment that's warmer, or move to a different spot within their own environment that's drier. But another strategy could be to have these antifreeze chemicals. These antifreeze chemicals bind to ice crystals and stop them from growing inside the body and causing damage to the tissue. This allows ladybugs to stay underground 
until the conditions are a bit warmer. When we imagine bees, like honeybees for example, we imagine them living together in a colony, each with their different roles. But actually, there's over 200 species of bees that live by themselves. These are known as solitary bees. Because they live by themselves, their day-to-day -day is organized a little bit differently to bees that live in a group, or communal bees. The awesome thing about communal bees is that they're eusocial, which means that one, everyone has a job, two, everyone helps look after the young, and three, there are overlapping generations. This system is so precise and so defined that bees in particular roles actually lose the ability to do other jobs. So for example, worker bees can't have young, only the queen can. Solitary bees have to do all this work themselves. This means that all females are fertile or able to have young, and each has her own nest in a tunnel or under the ground or in the hollows of a log. Because of these different living conditions, solitary bees don't make honey and they don't produce a waxy honeycomb. These guys are super important though. Solitary bees are one of the main pollinators. They don't have pollen sacs, which means that every time they go to a new flower, they're transferring pollen between them. Well, that's it for the first round of questions for Q&A. Like I said before, I really enjoyed doing this, so thank you guys so much for all your questions. If you have any more, or if you have any comments or feedback, just get in touch via YouTube or my Facebook page or even Twitter if you want. And of course, please make sure to subscribe down below. I'll catch you guys next time for more Science Wrap. Bye!